We have uh, still uh, one more item to cover as we uh, wrap up, and uh, Terry and myself and several of the, of the genomic medicine working group have been trying to capture some of the major themes that um, we, uh, we highlighted today, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Terry. A dangerous thing to do, but uh, we, are, we promise to end on time. That's, the, that's my promise to you. And, and I only have 30 slides, so it, so it shouldn't be that bad. Um, so, uh, so what we've tried to do is capture sort of some, you know, key points that came up. The, these are not, the, you know, the most important points necessarily or whatever, but things that sort of, you know, sparked us to think, oh, this might be something we could build on or something we should keep in mind as we, you know, go through tonight and, and into tomorrow in the breakout groups and, and elsewhere, and very much are, are hoping for you to, to help us refine these. We'll be sending these out to everyone along with a list of uh, uh, sort of your assignments for the breakout groups and a roster that has everybody's contact information in it. So Rita Chambers should be e emailing that to you momentarily. Um, but we thought we would just try putting this together um, just, just to kind of run through. And, and after it, in parentheses, are listed the, the places where we heard those comments, or at least we think we did. Um, and, and if that's wrong, you know, at least, at least the, the folks who were giving those presentations might know that there was something that you said that prompted us to put this up. So, um, so at any rate, um, there, there was uh, some, some uh, interesting suggestions about uh, the possibility of accessing anonymized or de-identified, however you want to define it, electronic medical records in some kind of a, a general database. And we heard that not only from the UK but also from, from Estonia. Um, and I think there, there may be some other places that are trying to do that, so we probably didn't catch them all. Um, but that would be something, obviously, you know, very useful models to be shared across countries for how you can do that within your country. And then, of course, there is always the issue of how do you share data in, in those databases across countries, and that's one that we'll, we'll struggle with a bit. Um, we heard about a bake-off or comparison projects on both sequencing and annotation pipelines um, that the UK uh, is taking the lead on, which is or, or, or actually just doing, uh, which, is, which is wonderful, and it would be neat if that could be a, a lead for others so that we could, you know, learn from it, build upon it, et cetera, um, and ways that we might be able to do that are, are things we perhaps we can talk about over a beer or, or other ways. Um, we heard uh, some interesting models in terms of approaches to genotyping. So in, in some places, the UK and Belgium in particular, it sounded like specialized genotyping centers were being established and used. I, I know that that's, that's a model I think that Canada uses as well. Um, in Singapore, we heard that the, the genotyping would be deployed across the existing framework. And in France, it sounded like it was a bit of a hybrid model where, where they were, there were some that were dedicated centers, but they were within an existing framework. Um, so again, different kinds of models for approaching this, but an interesting um, model that we have not used in the U.S. in terms of having dedicated genotyping centers for clinical care. We, we have, obviously, um, competitions for funding genotyping centers in the research realm, but we haven't done that in clinical care. And we may want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the pros and cons of those models and where that's appropriate and where perhaps not. Um, we've talked over and over about the critical importance of depositing data in ways that make it available to others, recognizing the challenges in doing that. Um, and there was, you know, mention of the Genomic Medicine Alliance that, uh, uh, that we'll be hearing about from, um, uh, from our Greek colleague, Dr. Petrinos George. I think I keep wanting to call you Ari, and I know it's not Ari. Um, so, and then, and then also the Global Alliance for Global Health um, model. So, so again, how we can do that. Uh, it was interesting, the, the comment that was made, I think, by one of our Belgian colleagues about looking at um, next generation sequencing guidelines for diagnostic sequencing. And, and I think what, what she said was we looked at the guidelines in the U.S. and the U.K. and the, and the Netherlands and then we kind of, you know, made our own. And it makes one wonder why are there guidelines that are different for diagnostic sequencing in those places? And is there some way to harmonize those or at least bring together those efforts and figure out, you know, what is it that the U.K. knows that the Dutch don't know or vice versa that, that might want to be shared? Um, and I think we heard repeatedly we should be reaching out, and we, we did try, but we, we will try uh, more uh, uh, after this meeting to the Global Alliance and to the uh, Rare Disease Consortium. So is there anything there that, that we got, like, completely wrong that you'd like to, to modify? Okay. 
All right, if not, um, then in addition on, the, on some of the international projects that we heard about, um, uh, there was the, the mention of population-specific traits, which, which really sounded sort of interesting um, from, the, from the, the Korean presentation. Um, could we consider these in, in a way experiments of nature or you know, certain, certainly human biologic variation that we could then link to genomic variation and learn more about from a specific population? These kinds of studies have been done before, obviously, but doing them on a genomic scale is a very interesting thought. Um, we also heard, I think, Korea, were, you were the only one that mentioned a population-specific reference genome, but clearly that, uh, yeah, and you, the, same, the same sort of thing. I mean, many populations are going to need that. We heard about uh, from, from uh, Gad, Gad uh, from our Israeli colleague, uh, the challenges of, of mixed ancestry populations and, and potential stratification. So they're, again, needing reference genomes. And wouldn't it be wonderful to have reference genomes across each of these countries that, that could be shared in some way? You're looking skeptical, Tim? Could you use the microphone, if you wouldn't mind? It's right in front of you. We keep it handy for you. I think you just keep talking. Yeah. Genome Reference Consortium hat on. Um, that's been trying to incorporate things from other populations and, you know, we kind of think that if you take 1,000 genomes data and beyond, eventually you end up with just one big graph which will represent the entire world population and rather than having individual ones for each country, it's that graph because everybody's going to be admixed to some extent um, and that will be the thing to align it. I mean, we don't really have the tools to deal with even the the structures within the genome reference at the moment, mm. you know, people don't align correctly against all the patches, but a graph is going to be much harder to deal with, but that probably is the future in terms of mapping. Mm. Great. Uh, yes. I mean, I guess uh, not to drill down too deeply into this, but I mean, th that seems like a laudable goal, but what's the interim strategy and how long will it take? I mean, and that to me seems to be the... And, and this might facilitate country-specific projects as well. Yeah. Aravinda, you wanted to comment? I mean, I mean, you know, this gets into a very difficult area. I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I think since we're really talking about a, any way you look at it, uh, there's some immediacy but some futuristic medicine. I think a laudable goal is what we should go for because the question is, is a reference genome for whom? I mean, and, and I, just, I, I just don't think that, you know, this has a possibility of getting into nationalistic labels and specific labels that is much more likely to harm this kind of personalized medicine. And, and, and so scientifically and in every way, you know, this graph representation of genetic variation in all humans is a much, much more effective way of looking at it, even if the national happens to be from some other ancestry, meaning a Korean of, say, South Asian ancestry might mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So we, we have just demonstrated that my population genetics expertise is terrible. So, <laughs> so my apologies. Um, but that's why we put these things up here. Um, so in addition, uh, we, we heard about uh, an, an interesting idea for a pharmacogenomics card, um, particularly related to you know, a, a really dreadful condition. And I can I was I was saying to our, our Thai colleagues, the reason that I'm I'm in this business is because of a case of Stevens Johnson syndrome that I saw as an intern that I will never forget and, and never want to see again. Um, and, and this is just a, a really cool idea. Um, so is there some way that, that we, could, we might be able to build on something like that? They have the you know, advantage and, and terrible tragic disadvantage of, of having a very high rate of this condition, and so it's, it's quite relevant to them. Um, but it, it may be that there are other similar conditions elsewhere. Mark. This may be the first example of a clinically applicable FIWAS, where you pick a, a, a drug adverse event phenotype and then look for all of the different uh, pharmacogenomic triggers uh, or drug gene pairs that can relate to that. I thought it was a really fascinating way to think about it. Yeah, and then we also heard about the, the interesting I idea in Israel of pushing family history data so that when, as I, as I understood it, when somebody has an event, you push that event to their brother, you know, son, parent, whatever, um, <laughs> into their medical record without identifying who the proband is so that that information can be used in their clinical care without essentially, you know, removing the privacy of that, of that person. So that is a very cool thing that's going on in Israel and, and again, something that would be not that difficult to do had, if we had linked, we couldn't do it in our country perhaps, but if there were linked databases, or sorry, linked uh, EMRs um, across, across family members, uh, essentially. 
that as it I should have known that Intermountain would have done it. So, but that that is a really neat idea, one we we could think about um, uh, transport or, or importing, uh, and the importance of negative studies we talked about a little bit in, in terms of uh, you know when when people do a genetic test, don't follow the the findings, you know the guidelines based on the findings, and it doesn't make a difference in care. That's important information to feed back to those clinicians so that they they change their practice as well as to the to the healthcare system. So aside from the population-specific reference genome, um, were there other anything else on here that people thought was off or needed modification? Okay, good. Um, for the panel discussion, well, we had a, a, a very robust panel discussion and, and very much appreciate um, the panelists as well as those of you who, who participated in that. Um, we did hear from, from uh, Irene that there is a, a recent solicitation that's uh, open on piloting the rollout of pers personalized medicine. I'm sure everybody at that point went to you know, Google and, and looked at what, you know, what kinds of things were being looked at. And you also mentioned that, um, that these are designed to be international in scope, uh, including European partners, obviously, but also so uh, international partners, so, so something we may want to take a look at. Um, enhancing data sharing through metadata sharing was a, a very interesting idea. Uh, and the, the, you know, as, as I understood it, um, basically having descriptions of what data are available and then having individual context be made uh, based on, on that. So, so another way that we might be able to get around this concern of, of you can't make all the data available to everybody. Um, we recognize the needs to harmonize policy and regulation. Harmonize may be a, a bit of a challenge for a variety of reasons, but at least to understand the reasons for differences across countries so that, that when, you know, an, an issue comes up in, in one country, you say, well, you know, they tried that in, in Australia and it didn't work or, or you know, it, it really isn't relevant to us because of X, Y, and Z. And those are things that uh, we do have a policy working group and perhaps they can be um, thinking about that. Um, we talked, uh, uh, a couple of folks, Aravinda and, and Anne, commented on, on we need to agree on what we consider to be evidence that a variant is actionable. And, and that may be one that's, that's going to be so case specific that, that we really can't have criteria. I mean, we, you know, some years ago we came up with criteria for what's replication in a genome-wide study. Well, that was a pretty standard thing. Um, and then a, a couple of years ago we tried to come up with criteria for implicating a sequence variant in, in a disease. And that was really hard. Um, but, but as ter in terms of what is actionable and what is not, it, it may be tough to come up with those. On the other hand, there could be some broad guidelines that, that we, we could agree upon, and that's something, I think, to think about. Um, Aravinda mentioned that we need case studies, and I, I wanted to give a shout-out to Mark Williams and the working group that he's leading in the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee, the education group that, uh, that I mentioned early on, uh, because there's a whole use cases working group, and one of the things that we're trying to do is take a standard template, send it out to, you know, whomever, and, and ask people to really define uh, some use cases or case studies that will get the attention of practitioners in a given specialty so that you could have a, you know, an eye disease Mendelian case and an oncology, you know, family history case, et cetera. Um, and, and those are things that I, I, I think we could, you know, crowdsource and get, get others to help with because it is a, a challenge to put those together. Um, and, and then the, the interesting idea that, again, Irene suggested about getting a map of, of ongoing projects. So you had mentioned um, to something going on in the Czech Republic and in German hospitals that we didn't know anything about, and, and is there some way to catalog those? Cataloging is a painful thing. Please, come. Okay. So that we recently funded a project um, which actually is keeping in kind of an observatory of ongoing activities in Europe on personalized medicine activities. Um, and there you can find a lot of information about different funding schemes and also some, some projects. Um, it's been European, but I know that uh, there are some information from Canada in there as well. And it would be quite interesting if we could do something on a more global scale on keeping track of what are the ongoing activities. So that's something we, maybe we could discuss on. Absolutely. Yeah. I think one of the action items I'm hearing emerging here is that uh, there could be a clearinghouse function for a lot of things that we've heard about uh, where we could have a one-stop shop to try and accumulate that uh, information um, and try and uh, uh, disseminate it more broadly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, and and especially if you've already funded somebody to do that, you know, bravo, That's, <laughs> that is great, um, and and perhaps you might perhaps send me or Jeff the link to, to that. That would be that'd be fantastic. So, good. Um, 
and then let's see. So then the second part of the of the panel discussion, um, there was the question, and I guess it touches on this that uh, uh, Phil T Patrick Tan asked about how to make um, those of us in this room aware of and engaged in ongoing efforts. So the the one that was had been raised at that point was the genome in the bottle um, effort, which is was to come up with sort of standardized uh, genotyping samples that then everybody could use and test their their methods against. And we'll get the the reference for that. I I, I know my colleague Jeff Schloss has sent it to me, and so we can we can distribute that out to you all. Hope you don't mind receiving emails from us, but uh, but at any rate, that's you know that's something that we need to be thinking about as as we leave this meeting, how do we then keep that kind of communication going without driving everybody nuts with emails and, and that sort of thing? Is that a website? Is it, you know, a, an observatory is a, is a great idea? Th those kinds of things. Um, reference samples I've mentioned. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, could we somehow bring together all of the exomes and genomes that are being sequenced now in various places and, and at least report the variants that have been seen there um, so that people would know that, yes, this has been seen before or no, it hasn't or whatever. Um, there are databases that are, are developed for that, the ISCA database, which I think changed its name. I'll need the IC, ICGG. I s David and David may want to comment on it. Could could you just extended from just um, um, CMB data from cytosomatic from a cytosomatic lab to include sequence variants from molecular diagnostic sequencing labs. So the combined is now international consortium for clinical genomic. Okay. So what what David said without a microphone, if I can <coughs> can. It, um, is that the, the initial consortium that was focused on cytogenetic array variants is now um, uh, including uh, sequence variants as, as well, and it is the International Cytogenetic International Collaboration, Collaboration? Of, clinical of Clinical Genomics. Great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so might there be some way to deposit data there or in the, the ClinVar database of our National Center for Biotechnology Information? I'm sure EBI has something similar to that. I'm sorry, Decipher. Sanger has the Decipher database, yeah. yeah. So the, there are opportunities there. And, and then, you know, we, we talked about, you know, we, we would all like to see an implementation pilot or even an implementation large-scale study, but not, let's not just pilot just to pilot something, but, but obviously to pick, pick the best and use implementation science methods to, to do that. Any objections with what's up here? Yes. Um, so, so Anne is saying is that we're, we're basically, um, the, we didn't touch, touch on the push-pull model, and I have to admit part of that is because I don't understand it. So, um, so I might ask w one of you to, who I think it was Warwick Anderson who was commenting on that. Uh, what exactly you mean by that, particularly for those whose English is not their first language, but even for me, I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> what, you, what you mean. Uh, could you come to a microphone? I'm sorry to, to get you up at this, this late in the day, but it would be very helpful. And might be better than, than me at this, but really it was the issue of um, generating the demand from the policy makers that they, they, they needed to line that up with what we think they need. Now, I'm not being very coherent. I'm only just some of this. Sorry, what winter. time is it's it in Australia? It's five o'clock or moment. something in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, just, that's just an excuse. I'm normally like this. So. <laughs> um, so, so it, it, it's, it's really making sure that, as we discuss any, discuss any of this, that we um, have those who have to make hard financial decisions there right from the beginning and with us, because um, no, no matter what value we generate from uh, uh, precision medicine, um, somebody is going to come up with it in a budgetary context. and they will provide a very strong and realistic view of priorities uh, that might not be the same as our priorities as researchers. Great. Thank you. 
Is, is that what you, yeah. I, and I think the other point there that I heard uh, was that, you know, we had some countries that presented that said we have national models that, you know, where the government is saying you do this. Others where we're not getting much response from the, from the national government, but where they're really going to the patients themselves. And so there has to be a grassroots component of that about not only what the clinicians and researchers want, but what the patients want and what energy the patients can bring to this process. So I would want to represent that as well. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a, a way to edit on the on the fly, but we'll we'll try and, and make these changes. So, um, let's see. Focus on the best. Oh, and then and then I think that you know the, the best comment that I heard all day was move beyond talking, uh, which both our, our uh, <laughs> Swedish colleague and and, uh, and and commented on, and I think we all recognize we need to do so. Good. Anything else in in here? Um, we do have, then there were a, a couple of uh, uh, additional international projects. I wasn't able to catch them all, but, uh, but we, we did hear from, from Warwick on the, a framework that you all have produced on translation of omics into care, and he'll hopefully be sending us the link for that, and we can share that with you all. That sounded very, very worthwhile. Um, and very interestingly, a, a personal electronic health record that can accept genomic data, that would be, the, I think, the first one that I've heard of that can do that. I don't know. Mark, you're, you're Mr. Electronic Medical Record. Do you know of any that can accept genomic data? Of course, Intermountain can, but no, no, <laughs> oh, okay. can yours? Really? Yeah. The whole genome? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Anyway. Really? Okay. Super. And then, and then I, um, I promised my last slide uh, was just a couple of additional points that didn't fit as, as uh, neatly in here. And, and don't disappear because Jeff is going to tell us what happens after this and dinner and that sort of thing. Um, was to, to develop a global, you heard ab about the ClinGen resource that, uh, that Eric described to you, which is this, this effort that we've begun to identify actionable variants that obviously action of a variant depends on, you know, the context, on the population, on the, the setting of clinical care, et cetera. So is there some way to, to expand that to a little mo more global approach? We've talked about pilot implementation projects a bit. Um, on the policy side, we talked about either a standardized informed consent or because informed consent is so culturally specific, are there at least models that we can use or, or some guides in that? And we've, we've taken this approach at NHGRI to say, you know, here are some components we think are really important in these and you can, you know, use those or tailor them to your own um, uh, settings. And then um, uh, some discussion of global EMR phenotyping standards. Uh, there, there was u universal, you know, sort of wringing of hands over how difficult this is to do, but, but I think, you know, we have some evidence that it can be done. It's not impossible, uh, particularly in dealing with electronic phenotypes and, and electronic logic that, that is translatable. Um, so, so let's not give up on this, and we have a working group addressing it. And, and as, as Jeff pointed out, we haven't talked about children really at all here. Uh, we haven't talked about newborn sequencing. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about the, the project that we're doing on on that uh, uh, tomorrow, but but those are other areas. So anything here that uh, an anything we've missed or? Oh well, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so I'll stop and then hand it over to Jeff. And yeah. Thanks, Terry. Um, wonderful job summarizing what you know the, the amount of ground <laughs> we've covered. <laughs> Who would have thought we would have actually talked about all that stuff in one day? Um, and we have more to come tomorrow. So uh, the purpose of this, again, was not to be conclusive, but to give you uh, a starting point, particularly for the breakout groups, where we don't want to re revisit these issues as issues. We want, as we'll charge you again to do tomorrow, ask you to begin thinking about the solutions and actions that you will take, that we could take as a group.